entrance hymn. <laughs> Saints, we are gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with her whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake he forgives us all our sins. As a called ordained servant of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray to the Lord for peace. Let us pray to the Lord for salvation. 
let us pray to the Lord for the well-being of the world and for the unity of the Church of God. Let us pray for Bible Lutheran Church as we offer God our worship and praise. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Now again, the Lord be with you. Lord God, you call us to be salt that gives flavor and preserves the world. Make us witnesses for Jesus by doing good to others and proclaiming the salvation of his cross and record, which redeems all people. Amen. in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30 beginning at verse 15 and this can be found in the Pew Bible on page 203 see I have set before you today life and good death and evil if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Here ends the first reading. The second reading is from Philemon, which is only one chapter long, beginning at the first verse, and that's found on page 1186 in the Pew Bible. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me, in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, if you consider me your partner, 
receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Thanks for reading. Good morning. Does anyone know what tomorrow is? No, not Ginger's birthday yet. We're getting closer, but it's not a birthday yet. Do we go to school tomorrow? Yes. No. Oh, how many days did we get this weekend? Three. Y'all were being goofy today. All right. So y'all evidently forgot because I know all your teachers told you not to go and come to school on Monday, right? All your teachers said, nope, don't come to school on Monday. Nobody's going to be here. You need to sit on your home. Um, because it's Labor Day. What's Labor Day about? Thank you. Labor Day. Anybody know? Anybody out in the um, congregation can tell us what Labor Day is? I'm getting no responses today. I don't know how to, how to handle this. No appropriate responses. Conrad knows. Conrad knows. So Labor Day is when we celebrate work. Do y'all know what the first job was on earth and when it happened? <clears throat> on day six of creation, God created one person. Who did he create? Bananas. Um, he did not. God created um, Adam, who was the first man on earth, right? And God gave him a job to do. And that job that he gave him to do was to work and take care of the garden, right? The Garden of Eden. So I brought with me something. Now, the appropriate answer is what? What did I bring today? Banana. Yes, I brought a banana. Correct. Um, this banana says it came from Ecuador. Wow. I know. So I want us to think a little bit about all people who had to work to get this banana from Ecuador to Bible Lutheran Church in Rincon, Georgia. Yeah. Well, first, who do you think helped plant the trees? God. God helped, for sure. Who's the person who works on the plantation? Jesus. Yes, Luna. Um, get him to. No, the farmer. So the, we know some farmers, don't we? Yes, we know some farmers, and they have to work very hard to make sure that the crops produce the fruit, okay? So you, the, the, the bananas are up on the tree. They stay anywhere from 9 to 12 months, the bananas stay up on the tree, right? And then somebody has to come along, and they have to cut the bunches off by hand. So they cut them off by hand, then they put them in a container, then that container somebody has to drive in a truck and get it to the ports. Then at the port, they put them in the big ships. How many of y'all have ever been out of Savannah? Raise your hand, please, and seen the great big ships at, in Savannah. When you go down to River Street, you can look out and see the great big ships. So those ships can have some bananas on them. And it's very specific. They have to keep the containers that they're in at 17 degrees. I don't know why it's 17 degrees, but that's what the internet told me when I was looking last night. So they have to keep the bananas at a certain temperature. Then, you know the little tugboat that goes beside the big boats? You got to have the person driving that. And you got the weatherman checking out the weather to make sure there's no big storm, right? Then they get into the ports at Savannah. Raise your hand if you know somebody who works at the ports. Yeah, we've got some people in our neighborhood that work. We actually have a neighbor that works on the big crane. He operates the great big crane. So then they take them out of 
the boats, the ship, I should say, and they put them in either the train, they ship them by train, or they ship them by um, boat. AT wheel. They may go on an airplane, but I think mostly they travel by um, train and the semi-truck. And then they get to your grocery store, and there's people who work at the grocery store. They, they unpackage them from the containers, and they put them on the shelves in the fruit department. And then you check out, and the cashier has to help, right? And some adult who can drive, or a teenager who can drive, has to drive to the store and grocery shop. How many of you feel like grocery shopping is work? Yeah, yeah grocery shopping is work too. And all of that to get this one little banana to Rincon, Georgia. So that's a lot of people working in it. Now we celebrate Labor Day. All right, so we talked about the first worker on earth was who? God. God yes, God created the earth, that was work. But then he created a man called Adam. Adam? And Adam's job was to take care of the Garden of Eden and the animals. And he named all the animals and took care of them. But on the sixth day, or the seventh day, God said we needed to, that he needed to rest. Right, so God created for six days and he rested on the seventh day. So Labor Day, we celebrate people who work in all different kinds of jobs. And hopefully when you get to be big and you decide the job that, that you want, you actually feel a calling, a vocation to work the job that you work. But we take a little break and we celebrate on Labor Day, okay, to help celebrate all the workers who do all the things um, to help us live a better and easier life. That sound like good stuff? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to cl close in prayer, and I want you to repeat after me. Ready? Dear God, thank you for making us all to do some kind of work so that we can help other people. Help us to know what you want each of us to do for our work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, go to Conrad. Get your paper. is found in St. Luke, the 14th chapter, beginning at verse 25. Lord, now great crowds accompanied Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple." Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
May be seated. Saints of God, I've been uh, reading a book uh, by a pastor, his name is Wayne Cadero, he's pastor of a um, big church out on Oahu, Hawaii Island, and uh, the title of the book is The Irresistible Church. So that kind of got my attention, hmm, what would it mean to be an irresistible church? And of course, we would ask ourselves all kinds of questions. What can a church do to be irresistible to others so that they would be interested to come here? But what I find interesting is that that's not exactly what he's getting at in this book. He actually asks the question, what makes a church irresistible to God? And what he means by that, of course, is what kind of church does God love to use for his kingdom work? And he references this verse. So it's from St. James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Let me read this. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Now, I've read that many times, obviously, through the years. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. So what is it that we can do that brings us near to God that in turn then, I guess, means God wants to come near to us? Well, first and foremost, a church that is useful to God is a church that, are you ready? This is a tough one, keeps the first commandment. It puts God out front, first place, high and lifted up. Drawing near to God is in essence the language of faith. Seeking the kingdom of God, as Jesus tells us to do, again, is the language of faith. Um, in our Bible class this morning, uh, the young adult class, we're reading in Genesis, and we had the story of Joseph meeting his brother Esau, and as they drew near, and then wrestling with God right after that event. So, wrestling with God is what faith does. It approaches God and seeks out God and calls out to God and embraces God into life. And so we do this in our own personal lives, and we had a nice discussion about that in Bible class. But the church also does this in a somewhat formal group way, and one of the ways we do that is what? Worship, right? What we're, what we're doing right now. You know, as you come in these double doors over the top, there's a little plaque that says, holy, holy, holy. And that's a reminder that we are gathering for an encounter with the triune God. As Isaiah, when he was caught up into the heavens in his call, heard that cry, holy, holy, holy in heaven, we really, as we come in here, are expecting to meet God. Or are we? Ah, it depends on whether you're coming in with faith or not, right? If you come in with faith, then you would expect that your gathering with God um, is something that is about to happen and something that's real. So we come in and we, of course, meet and greet, and that's important because we're the body of Christ and it's good to meet and greet with one another. And uh, it's good to see the pastor showed up again to earn his pay. And it's good that the choir is singing when, and they'll be started soon as, as, uh, as the fall goes on here. Um, but 
when you come in, are you in faith expecting an encounter with the living God? Not some far and distant thing that you could never get to know or touch or trust or put your life, you know, direction in. We're talking about the living God. Are your ears and hearts open to hear something from the Lord? Um, are you ready to give thanks to God for his many blessings? And one of the ways, quite frankly, that thanks shows through is in your song, isn't it? Right? Um, are you hungering and thirsting to take the medicine of immortality, as the early church called uh, the sacrament here in the Holy Supper? Uh, are you willing to lift the needs of others up to the throne of God in prayer? And yes, I know it's messy to get prayer requests and take time to do that, and even messier if I go out into the congregation and do that. But hey, are you willing in faith to do that work so that we can have an encounter with God in prayer? See? Worship is not a passive event in which the pastor and a few select people entertain you. And if your liturgical life has devolved down to that point, then it's time to reinvigorate it. Worship is an act of faith in which you are drawing near to God so that God may draw near to you. You know, one way to frame this what we're doing here in worship is to remind ourselves that together we are all considered, and here's a picture Paul uses, the bride of Christ. We're the church, the bride of Christ. We come on Sundays to share a holy communion with the bridegroom, who is our living and risen Savior Jesus Christ who promises to be among us where two or three are gathered in my name, he says, I'll be there. Now, I know you don't literally see his bodily form, but he does come. He comes through the word of the scripture and he comes in the sacrament itself as he gives his body and blood. And he comes within you as you bear in yourselves Christ Jesus by faith. Christ is here. And he is so gracious in giving us the gift of eternal life, pouring out God's spirit into our hearts, forgiving our sins, calling forth our faith, and strengthening it for service. But can you imagine if your life didn't have Jesus, or church, or worship? What would it be like? Oh, you could be busy in the world and you might find your little happiness with the worldly things, but the deep things of life would for the most part be missing in your life completely. Christ Jesus promises to be with us through word and sacrament wherever they are set forth among us. And as we Lutherans understand it, worship is not a quest for God, but the happy family renewal of the bridegroom and his bride. Jesus wants you here. He wants your heart. And he wants to impart the gifts of heaven to you. But this Lord and these gifts are received by faith. Psalm 145, 18 reads, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to call on him in truth. Faith is that full-blown trust in the person and work of Christ. It's what makes you irresistible to God, and a church of such faith-filled people then can certainly be an attractive uh, place in the world for those who might come in not knowing God, to those who are uncertain about their life and their purpose and where they're headed because they have no faith. So it's really important that you and I, every Sunday as we come together, not just that we live our lives out as willing, able, gifted servants, yes, that's true, but as we come in for worship, that we worship as a people who have come in faith. 
Now I know that's hard on any given Sunday because we often come in beat up by the world, we are tired from the work, or we didn't get enough sleep the night before, or there's conflict going on in the family, or we've any, you know, we've got worries on our hearts, uh, sicknesses and surgeries and all of that. So I understand that as we come in, we come in as wounded people. But it's precisely because that's who we are that faith is even more important to what we do here because it is wrestling with God, if you will, in faith in our service, wrestling with God to hear his word and what he's trying to say, wrestling with God and getting those anxieties out and giving them to him and taking those prayer requests up to him as the body of Christ that that makes this moment so holy. Holy, holy. Now, there's another thing to remember about drawing near to God that I want to bring to your attention. St. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 2. Let me just read these few verses here. No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. And then a little later on, Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. See, when you come to church for fellowship and worship, you don't come alone. The spirit of God comes with you. For the Spirit of God lives in you. And the Spirit of God's intention in the worship hour is to stir your faith up to receive those gifts of God. It's really important to remember that your faith, which grasps the salvation of Christ, is really in itself a gift of God that the Spirit has worked in you. What makes you irresistible to God for use in his kingdom is not you, sinner that you are. What makes you irresistible God to God is Christ within you, who Paul says is the hope for glory. And that Christ who is in you, who is with you is Christ the faithful, Christ the perfect Son of the Father, who does God's will willingly and at all times. And if you can see it this way then, and I'm going to change the metaphor now, not only are we the bride of Christ, and we want to meet the Lord Jesus, but he is now by faith, shaping us all into his body, the body of Christ, the other great picture of the church together. You may think you have nothing to offer God in your life, but you always have Christ within you, the hope of glory to reflect back to God. And Christ is in you because God has poured out his Holy Spirit into your life as a gift through your baptism. So when you come in for worship, no matter what your week was like, no matter what your anxieties are, no matter what your troubles may be, wrestle with God in faith. Bring your faith Cling to God, cry out to him, reach up in faith to heaven and say, Oh Lord, make yourself known to us and known to me in this holy hour. And you can trust that he will, because if you draw near to God, what did James say? God will draw near to you. And of course, he's given you these gifts of coming to you in the word, in the sacrament. So again, what we're doing here is not a fuddy-duddy old thing that the church just invented. It's worship. And yes, the liturgy is just the setting for the diamond, and you can change the liturgy or take it away. It's not the liturgy itself that matters, but the act of worship of the people of God as faith in action 
looking for God's manifest presence as he has promised. This is what we are attempting to be involved in every Sunday. So let me close by asking a very simple question. Do you understand yourself to be a spirit-filled person of faith? Because that's what you are if you're baptized believers in Jesus. You're spirit-filled people of faith. Someone who is a little Christ in the world, bearing forth the saving glory of God for others. Do you understand that that's who you are? That's who you are when you're here and you're here to recharge your batteries, if you will, in the Lord Jesus. And that's who you are when you go out into the world to serve him. If you so do understand yourself to be spirit filled people of faith. Then drawing near to God whether in worship or in prayer or in times of study, makes all the sense in the world. Because God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit dwells in all things. And God is calling all things back to himself. And that's what he's doing in us. So a church that is filled with people of faith is precious to God. And as I continue this series on down the road, I think we will see also that a church that is filled with people of faith can be very attractive to the world. Are we that church? Well, yes, we are. I truly believe that. Could we be an even greater witness for Christ in our worship and out in the world? Well, yes, we can always draw near to God. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we cry out that each and every week as we gather, you would indeed stir us up in faith, O oh Lord, to draw near to you. And as we do so, draw near to us with your gifts. Reveal to us your glory. Bring us into fellowship with your Son and fill us with your Holy Spirit. And we pray it in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. And now that lovely hymn, Amazing Grace.
now we confess our baptismal faith together. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. God of all goodness, we turn away from you or when we turn away from you and ignore your will and do what is wrong, we turn light into darkness and replace your goodness with our evil. Keep us from such folly. And when we do fall, call us back to repentance and life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Help us to choose life and to walk in your ways and to shun the pathways that lead to death. Lord, in your mercy. And God of power and might, you hold all things together through the laws of nature, and you provide energy and sustenance to all living creatures. Help us to recognize that we truly live and move and have our being in you, and that the labor of our lives is a blessing in your world and useful for your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. And God above all gods of the nations, Reveal your divine being to all people of every language, race, and tribe. Rule over the world by raising wise leaders among the nations and reveal your salvation and mercy by sending your gospel to all peoples. Use us to establish justice by doing what is right for all and send us as the spirit-led witnesses of your Son. Bless, we pray, our educational and outreach programs as we seek to make you known in our families and communities. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. God of the one holy Christian and apostolic church, continue to use your Christian pastors and congregations in Russia and Ukraine to be houses of healing and hope among their people. Strengthen the hands of all those who are caught up in the battles of this present age, even as you give voice to the peacemakers of the age to come. Lord, in your mercy. God of the future, we continue to place before you our pastoral search committees and the work they do. Send us, we pray, shepherds who have the heart of the great shepherd within them. Lord, in your mercy. And God of all compassion, bring your healing power into the lives of Lowell Morgan and Shereen Terry and Scott Jarrett and Dawn Varell and Brandy Ellis. Be with the Tram family as they mourn the death of their loved one. And we also pray that you would be with Jessica Terry and Give her safe travel, O Lord, and in this new beginning, O Lord, great joy in the work she can do for you. We thank you, O Lord, that you have brought our brother Walt home from the hospital and that you have worked healing in his life. And we ask now that you would hear us for those whose needs we lift before you from our hearts. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers especially for our sister Karen and our sister Dawn. They're precious to us, Lord. We rely on them so, for so many good things in this congregation as they share their gifts. Let your healing power be manifested in their lives, O Lord, in the days and weeks ahead. 
And we lift that prayer in faith to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. You lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and for our good benefit that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so at the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. on the night he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then after supper he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Welcome to the Lord's Feast. Take and eat the body of Christ for you, the body of Christ. This is Christ's body, given in the death for you, the body of Christ. Christ's true body, the forgiveness of your sins. This is Christ's body given unto death for you. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. Jesus bless you. Jesus bless you. The body of Christ for you. Welcome to the Lord's Feast. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ given unto death for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Christ's body given for you.
Depart in peace. God, you gave your son both of the sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen.